Good morning, church family. It is Thursday, April 2nd, and we are going to continue this morning with our discussion uh, from the New City Catechism. And today is question number five. What else did God create? Uh, if you are following, if you're following along in the app, you know that there's two answers. There's uh, what they call the adult answer, it's a little bit longer, and then there's an abbreviated one that is for children. And the longer answer is God created all things by his powerful word and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. The children's answer is God created all things and all his creation was very good. And we see this um, taught from scripture in Genesis 131. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. This is what the scriptures tell us. And in our last question and video from Tuesday, we talked about how and why God created you and I. And the two primary observations that we made were that God created us in his image and God created us to bring him glory. And tomorrow, Pastor Aaron will tackle the issue of how we bring glory to God with our lives. But for today, Let's talk a little bit about what else God created when he created. We see from our answer via biblical support that God created everything and that he simply did it by his word. He spoke and it came to be. Uh, and, that, and, and then and that in and of itself is pretty fascinating when you think about it. When you, when you read through the creation account in the early pages of Genesis and the text literally says, and God said, and there was. And this is the scope of everything that he created from the stars, the moon, the sun, uh, the, the animals, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the heavens, the earth, even mankind. When God spoke and let us make man in our image, we talked about this on Tuesday, um, God spoke, God acted, and man came in to be. Now, it's not that God merely spoke and it came to be isn't important. It is. <clears throat> but I want, us, I want to challenge us to think this morning about another portion of the statement that's made in our verse this morning of, of Genesis 131. It says, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was good. When God had created or excuse me, completed his creating work, his observation was that all that he had created was not just good, but very good. Six times prior to now, God has proclaimed that what he created was good. And it is now following the creation of man and woman that God looks upon all that he has created and declares it to be very good. The primary difference between good and very good here is the reality of what it is that God has created. And in creating man and woman, God had completed his pinnacle work. Uh, creating man was uh, the greatest work that God did. And that's a crazy statement when you think about it because, again, he... The scriptures tell us, I mean, he put the stars in place and he spoke into existence the sun and the moon and the planets and, and all of the cosmos. And, and, and that's, um, it's mind blowing. It's really difficult even really to wrap your head around. But, but then we see that the greatest thing that God created was mankind. And this goes back to our conversation on Tuesday about how because we were created in, in, in God's image, we're the pinnacle of what God has created, and that alone gives us value, meaning, and worth in our lives. And so man's been created. Again, it's, the, it's the, the, the pinnacle of God's creation. I mean, think about even when he made all of those things that we just referenced, the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, the heavens, the earth, all the animals, all the fish, all the birds, everything that he created, those things were good. When he created man in his image, it was very good. We were the part of creation that was created not only to bear God's image, but to have relationship and fellowship with God. And it, and it is at this point that God declares that all that he has created 
is very good. And a message like this might be kind of hard to hear today. Just, I mean, in light of everything that we have going on and, and just think of the, the world around us. But one of the things that I would say is, as I think of the Psalm where it says, what is man that you are mindful of him? I mean, even in everything that God has done and even in everything that God has created, um, the scriptures are very clear that God is still um, focused upon man. Man is still the apple of God's eye in regards to what he's created. And, and the work that he's doing is for the purpose of seeing the man that he created coming to know him and to bear out his image and to live their lives for his glory. But sometimes we find ourselves in places in life and, and right now is one of those places. This is an unprecedented time for the majority of people who are alive. Uh, we have never seen anything like this and chances are once we get through this, uh, we never will see anything like this again. The reality for most all of us is right now our entire worlds have been turned upside down. And I think this is even more likely and even more drastic in places where people aren't in little rural pockets like we are here in southern Indiana. That's where we're taping this from. I'm not sure where you're watching that, but this is where we're from here. And things have changed here, but they, they haven't changed like they've changed in Indianapolis or in Detroit or in Chicago. Um, and, and some of these major, these areas, I mean, life literally has been turned upside down. And with such chaos going on around us right now, and, and literally there's nothing that we can do, is this is where we're at currently. They have no answers, they have no vaccines, they have no treatments. They're just doing the best that they can to keep people alive who contract this disease. With so much chaos, with so much sickness, with so much death, with the numbers climbing, the death tolls are increasing, fear is growing amongst people. We might be hesitant to look around and imagine that at one time, this place was very good, is what scripture tells us. And the contents of this place, meaning what had been created, including you and I, was very good. But that's exactly what this passage of scripture and others invite us to do. The, the word behold carries with it the idea of coming, um, or of, of, of appreciating something upon gazing at or looking upon it. When you read Genesis 31, it's almost like God is inviting us to come alongside him and be mesmerized by all that he had done in creation at the end of the six days prior to resting on day seven. And again, on, on a day like today or in this current just climate and crazy times that we're living in, it might even be hard to behold something that God has created, to, to step back and look at it and to be mesmerized and to be in awe of all that it is. But I want you to know that days like today help us or can help us to appreciate the way things were long before us. And I don't mean the generation or two before us. I don't mean with my grandparents or with my great grandparents. I, I mean uh, in times of the days of creation. When God finished his completing work at the end of day six prior to resting, it was perfect. Everything that was created was perfect. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was only perfect harmony and relationship between everything that God had created and God, and especially between the pinnacle of God's creation, mankind and God. But I think I would submit to you this morning, days like today, as much as they can help us appreciate the way things were before, they also, for those who are in Christ, those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they give us encouragement, cause, and reason to look ahead and to long for the promises of Scripture. Consider with me the words of the Apostle John in Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. He says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Did you catch it as I read it? There was the word, behold, once again, where believers are invited to look upon that which is yet to come, a, a place where there is no death, where there is no sickness, where there is no pain, where there is no suffering, where there are no tears, where there is no mourning. The scriptures tell us that God will be there. He, and, and excuse me, God will be there. God's people will be there. He will be their God and they will be his people. Looking ahead to the promises of, of glory do not require believers, followers of Christ to be any less faithful today. And, and that's important for us to be mindful of. We still have a duty and a responsibility as, as long as we're here. But that doesn't mean that we can't long for a day when everything that we're experiencing right now, all of the chaos and the consequences and the results of this chaos. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. It is not wrong to long for that to be gone. And the scriptures tell us a day is coming when it will be. I don't know when it is any more than any of you who are watching this know when it is. But what we do know is that scripture calls us to live in light of what we profess to have believed about Jesus until that day comes. So we live responsibly today and tomorrow, if the Lord would will it, as we look ahead to the full manifestation of what God has prepared for those who love him. So we strive to be faithful with our lives and one day we understand that the fullness of God's promises will arrive. But keep in mind, as we discussed on Tuesday, the arrival of God's future promises are guaranteed on the basis of what Jesus has accomplished through his death and resurrection and your individual response to it. For each individual to be able to look ahead, hoping and longing for the promise of future restoration requires that a person have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what we talked about on Tuesday. Scripture calls it the gospel, the good news that though there was a time when God created everything and it was very good, Genesis 131, two short chapters later, Genesis chapter three, we see that everything in the world as we know it changed. And as much conversation is taking place about why the coronavirus is running rampant and where it has come from, scripture is very clear that the issue, the primary issue at hand is sin. The coronavirus at its original root is a result of the fallenness of man, sin entering into the world in Genesis chapter three. And, and God had created everything, sin entered into the world in Genesis 3, changing the state of perfection that God had created everything in. And then from that time forward, um, God would, we know, you may know the story, God would draw his people out of Egypt. He, before that, he would choose a man named Abram, and he would be the father of a nation. That nation would be Israel, and, and then that nation would grow. There's a lot that we're kind of glossing over here. Um, but uh, the, the nation would grow and then they would be, uh, they would come out of captivity out of Egypt. Many of you are familiar with the Exodus. And then they, there's just this march through the wilderness and all these events take place. And then there's all these, these captivities of the people because of sin in their lives and idolatry. And, and you know, God keeps promising a, a deliverer. God keeps promising a deliverer. And in Matthew chapter one, we're introduced to a man named Jesus who all of the prophets in the Old Testament spoke about, who all of the prophets of the Old Testament looked forward to. And, and what we have to understand is the man Jesus, the God-man Jesus, was the answer or is the answer to the sin problem that we have, both us and the nation of Israel. Um, Jesus is the answer to the, the, the problems and the issues and, and everything that weighs against us in this life. Jesus is the answer to realizing the full promises of God in the future. And I wanna, I wanna pause for a second and say that, you know, if you're watching this and you haven't trusted Christ as your savior, I want you to understand that 
you know, if today were the day or tomorrow were the day where you to place your faith and trust in Christ, I, I can't tell you that that means your circumstances are going to change. Scriptures, they don't, they don't promise that. And some of you may be going through things and experiencing things that um, placing your faith and trust in Christ may not immediately change. Um, but, but what happens when we place our faith and trust in Christ is our perspectives begin to change. We begin to see things uh, through different lenses and, and with different, you know, purposes. And, you know, we don't always understand why God is doing what he's doing, but we do know that scripture tells us that he can work through it and that he will work through it. And so when we think about things like today and we think about the chaos of the world that we're currently living in and we long for that invitation of God to behold the new heavens and the new earth that's coming where there is no death, where there is no mourning, where there is no sickness, where there is no disease, we must also understand that in order for us to behold and to experience the place that God has promised, we must place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And and in short, that means to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. And belief, we talked about the other day, belief uh, always motivates action. We, we know what we believe based upon the fruit that it bears in our lives. And so I would ask you this morning, as we close, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about the scriptures? Do, do you believe that, that the hope and life is offered in the person and work of Jesus alone and nothing else? This is a question that you have to ask um, for yourself. But you know, I, I, I know when I, I see and I hear and I watch and I listen um, and is inconvenient and is not ideal as everything that we're going through right now is, and this might sound bad and I don't mean to be, be insensitive, but it's gonna get way worse. It's gonna get way worse. And I don't mean in the next two weeks from the coronavirus. I, I just mean scripture tells us that a day is coming when things are drastically different than they are now and, and even worse. And, and the question that we must ask ourselves is, are we ready? Are we prepared? If whatever shape, form, or fashion it is that the Lord calls us home, um, are we ready to be called home? Uh, are we being called to a realization of seeing and knowing the fullness of what God created originally and what he will create anew again in the future? Pray with me, would you? God, we just thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope of a future place where there is no death, disease, and sickness where, God, we can dwell with you and you will dwell with us. And we just pray this morning that uh, for anybody who's watching this, when and wherever they may be watching it at, God, we would just pray that uh, they would know what it means to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and that they would have the hope of being able to look ahead and long for um, that place that you have promised. And uh, God, we just pray that you would help us to live faithfully now in, in light of what it is that we long for in the future. And we'll be careful to give you the honor and glory for it. God, we just pray that you give us a good day today. We pray that you would uh, help us to be wise, just to make good decisions. May we honor and glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good day, church. Love you. And uh, Lord willing, I'm going to see you soon.